Welcome to Business Lunch this Friday afternoon. I'm Nisha Podar and with me as always is my co-anchor Pavitra Parekh. So we are ending the probably the week on a good note, on a green note today and market really holding up a lot to do with the US markets and the kind of volatility they saw but definitely ending with gains and therefore that's reflective on our markets as well. Actually not taking cognizance on a Friday afternoon of any of the bad news in terms of the macros coming in, especially from the inflation front globally. So 1.5% up, 267 points gain on Nifty 50 at the moment. So holding on to 17,280-odd levels. Remember that the market in Nifty 50 opened above 17,300 levels today. Bank Nifty, the financials are really taking the lead, outperforming the key indices over 2% up in trade at the moment. And mid-caps are slight underperformance. Yeah, 1% up in trade at the moment. But remember that um, definitely it is adding to the overall momentum in the market. And because of the broader markets being up in the green with 1% gain, the advances are far ahead of the declining stocks. Uh, so there's a broad-based rally that we are seeing and a relief being seen. Only JSW Steel, Power Grid, m and are some of those heavyweights on Nifty 50, which are showing a red tick at the moment. Well, this is a good looking screen, right? Any way you look at it, we got that good handover. Asia is all green. Our markets are holding up just well. We saw that big gap up opening and the good part is that we've been able to hold on to those kind of gains, right? So you can see the gains across Asia have also been very good. In addition to some of the large cap IT names that, you know, Nisha was looking at, if you take a look at mid cap IT, that's also looking extremely good. So Mindtree, of course, posted results. Uh, there's the buzz that uh, the LNT Infotech merger, in fact, the management told us that it will happen by next quarter. So we're waiting by for those results that stock up uh, and about ahead of that persistent is doing well the entire mid cap it space is doing well in addition to the financials of course uh, th these are the stocks which are sort of really ruling the roost today on the downside a little bit muted you have the real estate pack today and some of the cement names also are a little bit muted so those ones will come up on your screen and then we're looking at bajaj auto ahead of its uh, earnings so that's what we're tracking in terms of market action but let's get straight to it and we'll start off with tech infosys is rallying after it reported a good set of numbers for the second quarter. The board also approved a buyback worth uh, 9,300 crore rupees along with its numbers. So Reema is here to take us through all of the highlights. Reema. Thanks so much for that. Well, you know, it's a good showing considering uh, the fear that was going into these numbers, the fact that we will already start seeing some signs of slowdown, at least as of now. The Q2 numbers were very strong and even the FI23 guidance reaffirms that things for now appear to be stable. No one knows what FI24 is going to be. There is no visibility on that. But at least for the next three quarters, the outlook seems to be in intact. And given the fact that the stocks had gone into these earnings with, um, you know, with a you know, position more on the short side, uh, the valuations are derated, we are seeing that pop in the stocks. So Infosys, there was a big Q2 margin beat, the deal wins were very strong, going up 50% on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, the buyback also adding to the support. On the top line, there was a bit of a miss, but more than compensated on the margins in Q2, expanding by 100 basis points. Uh, FY23 guidance on the top line has been tightened, they've raised the lower end of the guidance, so now revenues for Infosys will be within the band of 15 to 16% and margin guidance um, in a way has been tightened towards the downside. So margins for Infi will be in the range of 21 to 23 percent. Largely the management commentary was also fairly encouraging. Uh, they do talk about some macroeconomic issues but all companies are caveating that things are volatile so therefore there is a bit of a wait and watch. The buyback is adding to the support. It's a 9,300 crore open market buyback at a maximum price of 1850 which is fairly healthy. Brokerages continue to maintain the faith on enforces across the board. We've got some buy ratings from brokerages. Back to you. All right, Rima. Thanks so much for all those details. And some of those uh, important factors and positive factors that Rima was mentioning is reflected on the Infosys counter today, surging ahead in trade. Let's also hear out the management of Infosys. In fact, MD and CEO Salil Parekh had to say about the numbers um, and uh, what's the way forward. Let's listen in. We have seen as we go through the quarters, normally we reduce the band of the guidance mm. uh, as we see more visibility within the, the full financial year. Mm. Uh, we've seen very good large deals momentum. Uh, we've seen good pipeline mm. and a good uh, Q1 and Q2 on growth. 
uh, and there we've uh, made the guidance in the top end. So we had 14 to 16, and now we made 15 to 16, yeah. which is at the higher end of the guidance, which gives us more confidence and visibility of what is going on within the year. Margin guidance, uh, last quarter we had said that uh, our guidance was 21 to 23 percent, mm. but that we would be closer to the lower end of the guidance. Yeah. Uh, as we've come in here for this year specifically, uh, since uh, we felt we were going to be at the lower end of that, uh, closer to the 21 percent uh, in the guidance, we've decided to reduce uh, the ban. All right, that is the management of Infosys. It is still the top gainer on the Nifty. But staying with the IT space, Mindtree also delivered a beat on all fronts in the second quarter. It's an extremely healthy performance. So earlier today, we spoke to the company's MD and CEO, Debashi Chatterjee, about the outlook for their business going forward. Listen in. Pretty good quarter. And this is the seventh quarter, consecutive quarter of 5% uh, plus growth in constant currency. Uh, as far as uh, outlook is concerned, uh, uh, you, you know, there are uh, certain softness in specific areas. And uh, if you look at, for example, RCM, we had already called out about some uh, softness. And uh, uh, on top of that, the currency also did not help. So that's why you saw a slight decline. But if you look at constant currency, we still grew in RCM. All right, so that's about the IT space. Let's also hear out what Kenneth Andrade of Old Bridge Capital Management had to say on the entire IT sector given the recent correction in this particular space and after the prospects have changed, probably with the guidance as well as the results coming in. Listen in. Well, they're still up almost 80% since two, uh, for the last three years, right? So they've done extremely well as far as these businesses are concerned. And they've done so because they've, everything's gone in favor of these companies. But what has not gone in favor of these companies is obviously, uh, uh, is obviously their uh, uh, cost of manpower. Uh, I think all of that is getting addressed right now. So, so valuations are the best that are, are much better than they've ever looked before. Uh, if you if you go back to that database of IT companies out there, you'll get someone who's available at a 10% cash flow yield. You'll get companies available at a 5% dividend yield. So, so yes, value in that segment at a 52-week low in a number of those names is is emerging, is emerging, and it's emerging rapidly. All right, that is the word coming in for IT. By the way, the IT sector this week has been the best performing sector. It's up around 1.5% uh, at a time when the market has actually seen some cuts. So that's a complete roundup on the IT space. We are going to get, a sh get into a short break now. But up next, the U.S. has reported higher than expected CPI number for the... Welcome back. You're still watching Business Lunch. Now, the insurance regulatory body, the IRDAI, has released a draft paper to regulate ownership as well as investment norms in insurance companies. So, Yash is here to bring us up to speed with the details. Hi, Yash. Well, that's correct, Pavitra. So, as far as the draft paper from IRDI is concerned, it deals with three important aspects. One is what would be the regulations when it comes to starting a new insurance company? How would the promoters uh, be subjected to regulation? Second one is the promoter or the investor lock in a different stages of that insurance company and the third one is private equity investments what regulations would they be subjected when it comes to exit in these insurance companies I'll start with a lock-in for promoters or investors uh, once you start the company you receive the business license uh, there will be a five-year lock-in for promoters uh, lock-in if invested uh, within five years of business commencements commencement in that case uh, the lock-in would be for either for five years or or eight years from the grant of business certificate to the insurance company, whichever out of the two comes earlier. The next one, when it comes to lock-in for promoters, when the amount is invested after five years, but before 10 years, in that case for promoters, the lock-in would remain either for three years or uh, for 12 years after the company received its business license, whichever comes earlier. For investors, it will be earlier of two years or one year from the grant of business license. Finally, if the amount is invested after 10 years of business commencement, in that case, the promoters will have a lock-in of two years, investors will have a lock-in of one year. As far as uh, the private equity investments are concerned, uh, there are important things which have come here also. As far as private equity investments, uh, which are eligible to invest in insurance companies are concerned, they should have completed 10 years of operations. Funds raised by that private equity fund should have been more than $500 million. Investable fund with that private equity company should have been more than 100 
100 million dollars and finally uh, the private equity fund should have invested in the financial sector in any jurisdiction but importantly there was a condition earlier where private equity investments had to happen through an SPV route that has no mention in these draft regulations. All right, uh, Yash, thanks so much for getting us all those important details from the insurance space. Let's also get you an update on an important story. Well, the maiden pharma fiasco is what we are talking about, and the company is in the dock after deaths of 69 children in Gambia, where, uh, which were linked to their cough syrups, remember, which broke out a few days back. Now, after Haryana decided to halt production at company Sonipat plant and other states have also swung into action after this event and Haryana's action on this. Santhya Gora, our colleague, is here with all the details on this development. Tell us, Santhya, this is a grave issue. What are the steps being taken and what is the company saying? So, absolutely, Nisha. Talking about uh, the controversy uh, surrounding Made in Pharma, after that controversy, state FDA units, they have swung into action. So whether it's Maharashtra, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, all these states, they have uh, directed their FDA field officers to collect samples. Uh, so there are multiple aspects to this. First of all, all these state FDA units, they have instructed and they have ensured that all the products of Made in Pharma, uh, despite the fact that only a very uh, small range of Made in products are available for domestic use, uh, these FDA units, state FDA units have instructed that what Whatever remaining products are there, uh, first of all, they have to be checked for any kind of impurities. Uh, second, apart from this, if we talk about the other uh, aspect of uh, this particular drive, this action, so these state FDA units, they have instructed their field officers to collect samples from all the oral liquid, liquid solutions, whether it's the raw material or the final products. Now, talking about Maharashtra, Maharashtra has around 1,000 uh, pharmaceutical units, Nisha, and out of those, there are 250 liquid oral solution producing uh, companies, uh, uh, pharmaceutical units and uh, samples of all those units are being collected. Now Karnataka has actually uh, directed all the pharmaceutical uh, companies to actually submit their oral uh, assessment of the products which they purchased in last one year, uh, especially glycerin and uh, propylene uh, glycol, all these products and this report has to be submitted within one week. Tamil Nadu field officers of FDA units, they are collecting samples uh, for the last five days, but as of now, they have not found any uh, product with any impurities. Talking about Andhra Pradesh and Kerala, similar orders have been issued by those FDA units as well. Uh, we spoke to UP or FDA unit as well, and there also field officers have already started collecting uh, samples, and there are uh, stages to that. First, raw materials of these pharmaceutical uh, companies, that, which are state-based, individual state-based, uh, they will be Collected. Second, the final product of these companies, these pharmaceutical units, will be collected as far as oral solution is concerned. And apart from that, uh, those pharmaceutical units which are not based in these states but their products are being sold in these states, uh, their samples will also be collected. Nisha. All right, Santhya, thanks a lot for running us through all of the details on this very important story. So for now, we're seeing a lot of state FDAs uh, moving and, you know, sort of jerking into action and uh, moving fast on this very important issue. But with that, we're going to shift focus to some important international news. The CPI for the month of September in the United States came through yesterday, and it has been higher than expected, with prices rising 8.2% on a year-over-year -year basis, which is off its peak of around 9% in June. But if you look at the level, it is still at levels which we've not seen since since the early 1980s. Excluding volatile food and energy prices, the core CPI also came in higher for the month, accelerating at 0.6%. This is versus the estimates that we had of 0.4% increase. Now, core inflation was up 6.6%. This is from a year ago level, and the biggest 12-month gain that we've seen since August of 1982. So, Nisha, this whole inflation concern, of course, remains uh, at top of mind. But the market is clearly defined <laughs> all the concerns. I guess it was priced in, right? Concerns. I mean, for all of these weeks we've been sort of building up to it and we were talking to some guests earlier this morning as well so they said because we've just fallen so much in, an, in anticipation at least it's out of the way all right so that's been baked in into the valuation and market is moving ahead after the data is out now on to some news coming in from europe well investors remain on the edge as the bank of england's emergency bond buying program comes to an end today now here's a special report from outside the central bank on everything Thing that has really conspired till date.
Recently, Bank of England decided to intervene just three days after the mini budget, three working days, I should say, is because of the huge disruption that we saw happen in guilds after that budget came out. And the thing that spooked investors was that 45 billion package of unfunded tax cuts, which was going to raise borrowing in coming years and put a lot of pressure on public finances with no real trajectory of how they plan to bring it back in balance again. So on the back of that, we saw guilt yields initially rise about 100 basis points in two working days. The Bank of England saw that what was happening and thought, well, this could actually have some really negative consequences on the broader economy, on the financial system. We have to come in and support the market temporarily so that the pension fund community, who are very exposed to the long end of the UK guilt curve, can actually have a little bit of time to rebuild their capital buffers and meet their margin calls. Initially, the reaction in the guilt market was quite positive. Since then, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, not helped by Governor Bailey's comments on Tuesday this week at the IMF when he suggested that the pension fund community only have three days left to get their house in order. So uh, this is where we are today. In total, they have bought 65 billion, they, well, they had an envelope of 65 billion pounds. They bought 17.8 billion. And uh, clearly, you know, there are going to be questions about whether they'll have to restart this program again in the future. All right, Jamana, thanks a lot. Welcome back. You're watching Business Lunch. Now, Rajasthan's royal forts, palaces, and silver sand dunes used to attract over 500 lakh tourists every year. Now, the lockdown brought this thriving industry to a screeching halt. But things are now looking up, and CNBC TV 18's Satya Gora reports that the desert state is hoping these green shoots will grow into a lush oasis once again. Take a look. Rajasthan has always been a big tourist destination. From Pink City Jaipur to Blue City Jodhpur to Golden City Jaisalmer, the state's rich heritage and colourful cultural attractions brought in over 500 lakh tourists every year and tourism accounted for about 15% of the state's $150 billion economy. But the lockdown changed everything. These forts and palaces, which were a major tourist attraction, had to be shuttered. And as a result, the sector, which was the state's third largest employment generator, ran out of gas. For Hemraj Balhotra, who has been working as a licensed guide at Jaipur's Amir Fort for over six years, the two-year lockdown was a nightmare, one that didn't end when the lockdown was lifted. देखो गुजारा तो देखो पहले तो जो थोड़ा बहुत बचा कुचा था उससे काम चला है फिर बाद में इधर उधर से करके काम चला है क्योंकि टूरिस्ट बिल्कुल नहीं था उसके बाद जब थोड़ा थोड़ा लॉकडाउन हटा तो मार्केट में है तो कोई नहीं आता था शुरुआती एक साल में तो यह बहुत कम टूरिस्ट होता था इक्का दुक्का आसपास का देखने को मिलता था या लोकल को जयपुर के होते थे तो उन्हीं से जबरदस्ती करके हाथ पाँव जोड़ के दिखाना पड़ता था एलाइड इंडस्ट्रीज एंड बिजनेस ऑल्सो सफर लॉकडाउन हटा तो उसके कुछ महीनों तक तो टूरिस्ट बिल्कुल ही आया ही नहीं और अब धीरे धीरे लोग आ रहे हैं ऐसा लग रहा है कि इस सीजन में जो है बहुत ही अच्छा काम चलेगा और फिर से हमारा सबका बिजनेस बहुत ही अच्छा ग्रोथ करेगा एट नाहरगढ़ फोर्ट विच लाइज 11 किलोमीटर अवे द स्टोरी इज मच द सेम द लॉकडाउन मे हैव बीन लिफ्टेड बट द पिकअप इन टूरिज्म एक्टिविटी इज स्टिल स्लगश and its domestic tourists who are making up the bulk of the visitors jaise lockdown khula hai uske baad mein tourist point pe tourist nazar aaya dekh samay aisa tha ki tourist bilkul dekhne ko nazar hi nahi aata tha 2020 mein to sirf indianon ke alawa aur kuch aati nahi thi 2021 mein indian hi aate the ab phone larana ab shuru hua hai 2022 mein to bahut hi zyada jansankhya kam aane lag gayi pehle se to bahut zyada kam hai The pickup since this year's tourist season began in July August has given these people hope. Experts say 2022 is now on track to bring some much needed relief to the sector and the state especially if the peak season of October to March sees an upswing in arrivals. Thoda thoda season ab chal raha hai jaise dheere dheere jaise sardi aayegi log itna hi zyada aayenge. Aur ye jaise corona chala gaya usko dekhte saath bhi public nikalne lagi. 
and that's music to many years. The tourist season has begun. October to March is the best time to visit Rajasthan. This year's tourist season will determine whether the state has recovered from the lull caused by the pandemic. The government is confident that the state's tourism will bounce back to pre-COVID levels. People associated with the sector also claim that they have used the lockdown time for renovation and maintenance so that once things open up, they can attract more tourists than ever. In Jaipur, Rajasthan, with camera person Milind Wagmare, this is Santhya for CNBC TV18. All right, so the good news is that tourism is picking up and there are lots of green shoots visible. Hopefully, this will only, you know, solidify in the festive season. So that's some good news coming in. But on that note, we're going to wind down on this edition of Business Lunch. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Mid-Cap Radar is up next.